Good day, Star Wars was, and to a certain extent still is, the most popular media franchise of all time. Millions of fans were enraptured by its three films, and the novels, the comics, and the games brought in millions more. Its fans were addicted to the lore, the characters, the spacecraft, and a galaxy of near endless adventure. And then in 2014, all of that was silenced by the heretical actions of the great chaos god Disney. But a new hope rose when a little show blasted upon the air, featuring a man with no name, clad head to toe in Beskar, wielding a blaster pistol of great justice. And lo, from the ashes rose one man, one Mandalorian. Star Wars fans had been starved for good Star Wars for so long. The EU had been murdered by Disney way back in 2014, and the crap Disney had been spewing had been derivative garbage at its best, and it was a distorted imitation of the EU at its worst. Star Wars was never just laser swords and space wizards. At its simplest, Star Wars was a clash between good and evil. Sometimes the heroes were bright and shiny, like the true Luke Skywalker, and sometimes they were drug-addled louts that researched the good Skywalker name, like Cade Skywalker. But hey, he eventually got his shit together and kicked the drugs and Darth Krayt's ass. For the lay fan, they knew not the mighty adventures of the Skywalkers or the Skiratas. They were left with Rey or that woman from Rogue One. But all that changed. By the will of the Force itself, Disney made a show that appealed to the true follower of the Jedi Code. It featured a cool protagonist instead of a teenage girl. It had music that was inspirational instead of forgettable. It had the craft, it had the characters, it had the lore, it had everything Star Wars was meant to be. And had been before the rise of Darth Kennedy. Come along with me, gentle viewer, as we take a step into a larger world. The Mandalorian features the adventures of a simple man named Din Djarin as he makes his way through the galaxy. The story takes place after the Battle of Endor and has one foot in both Star Wars continuities. There is some Disney heresy and there is some true Star Wars expanded universe. And this melange works quite well, however when it goes Disney the show suffers, but there is enough true EU that the show's quality shines through even the dankest of Disney muck. Diddy Boy has a small supporting cast that consists of Coruscanthea Dune of Alderaan. She is an ex-Rebel Alliance drop trooper that is tough but fair. She does not subscribe to the modern female character concept and is nice to Din Djarin and never shows him up and is a stalwart friend. Grief Karga, he is a more morally ambiguous version of Lando Calrissian. He is a hero, a villain, and something in between. The show only gives us glimpses of Mando's past and leaves him a stoic warrior, but over the course of the show he opens up a bit, but he never engages in a struggle session like a certain Halo show. Sadly, Mando is brought down by one concept. That little green imp, the Yo Baby, later renamed Grogu, he is the driving point of the plot for this and season two. Sadly, Grogu just doesn't have that much in the way of characterization and mainly just coos and gurgles and until the very end of season three cannot communicate at all. And for me at least, and I think for many fans, his cuteness wears off after a bit, and I think the over-reliance on Grogu is why the Mando show really didn't have the staying power it should have had. The villains of the show range from bounty hunters to Imperials. In this continuity, it's implied that the Imperials are all in hiding, and in Season 3 we learn that the New Republic are decommissioning their fleet? Hope the Sissy Rook and the Yuzhen Vong don't show up in this continuity! The Mandalorian culture on offer in this show is a bit odd. Beskar is used to describe the armor, and Mandos come from Mandalore, and the show leans towards the Mando culture scene in the amazing Republic Commando novels, but we don't see Mando language, and the Mandos in Season 1 all belong to a religious sect that never existed in the true EU. And it's kind of a dumb one, with an overemphasis on never removing one's helmet? This aspect of culture and Din Djarin's nickname of The Mandalorian was I hope inspired by a single bit of flavored text for Mandalore in Knights of the Old Republic 2. Mandalore in that game was really named Candorus Ordo, and in that game Candorus is only rumored to never take his helmet off. So I guess the writers of this show assumed all Mandos did that. The biggest problem with the show is its pacing. It goes super fast and then slows down for half a season. And then speeds up again at the very end. Instead of spreading out the action across the season, major events happen off screen or just implied. Finally, the show loves fake surprises where it pulls a concept out of its butt plate instead of letting it build up naturally. The dialogue is mostly okay, but the Mandos have more fantasy themed lines than they really should have. 
in the true EU, they were never backwoods mystics. Instead, they were just normal mercenary kind of guys. There are also some lame lines to be found, but mostly that is balanced by the better performances by the lead actors. Action and special effects are pretty bloody good. Most of the action takes place on the ground this season, and the battles are somewhat elaborate. My favorite is the final battle where Mando pulls a true Master Chief and picks up an in-place weapon and blasts a crap ton of stormtroopers with it. However, with that in mind, the enemies in the show are all pathetically weak. Our heroes have bloody god mode on, or barring that, the lowest difficulty setting. They never get hurt, and they blast enemies by the bushel, thus lowering the stakes in any given fight. And this will only get worse as the series goes on. Despite my complaints, the show is still a fun watch and worth one's time. The first episode is an excellent introduction to our hero. It starts up with Mando walking into a bar to collect a bounty. The mercs in the bar don't like this and Mando shows them the error of their ways. Permanently, one Merc gets bisected by a door and this sets the tone for the show and Mando himself. This ain't gonna be a bloody Disney crap. It's gonna get rough, and Mando gets an awesome line of, I can bring you in warm, or I can bring you in cold. The bounty he collects, though, has some lame lines, but is swiftly frozen in carbonite. Mando gets payment from a guy named Grief Karga, and is told that an Imperial is offering a high bounty that will be paid in Beskar. Mando accepts the mission. After accepting the mission, Mando goes to his Mandalorian covert. This never existed in the EU either, and he meets up with the covert's leader, the Armorer. Although the show never directly says that the Armorer is the leader of the Mandalorian covert. He gives the Armorer a Beskar ingot, and the Armorer forges it into a new shoulder pad. And during the forging scene, Mando has some flashbacks about his past. As a child, his family was killed by super battle droids, thus instilling in him a hatred of droids that lasts all of five minutes! He then goes to a budget-friendly desert world. Better get used to that! As a lot of Mando takes place on budget-friendly desert world. Mando's ship is called the Razor Crest. It is a silver ship somewhat reminiscent of the Lardy gunship from the Clone Wars. I find the design to be a bit boring and thus never had a desire to collect it. Sadly, Disney Wars cannot make a cool ship to save the life, but they do make cool armor and in the first couple episodes, Mando starts out with nicely detailed Mando armor that is very different from the true EU Mando armor, but I have to admit it looks pretty damn good as it is packed to the brim with details. And he has a cape, just like Boba Fett back in that one good bit of Star Wars The Holiday Special. And in season one, he is rocking a rifle just like Boba Fett had in that too. His armor in the early part of season one is more damaged and more grungy than the later armor will be. On Desert Planet AA23, Mando meets Quill, a character that will become a fan favorite due to his pattern of speech and unique look. I still think his prosthetics look like crap, but whatever. Quill teaches Mando to ride some giant lizards and the epic Mando theme plays as they ride to where the bounty is being kept. Mando then teams up with an IG assassin droid. This droid is a knockoff of IG-88. He and Mando blast their way into a Merc stronghold. This battle is fun. And Mando gets on the turret and there's a bit of decent humor where the IG droid tries to keep self-destructing itself. Ultimately, it turns out that bounty was a yo baby. The assassin droid tries to end my suffering. I mean, blow away baby Yoda, but Mando is faster on the draw. Episode one is an excellent pilot and the action kick ass. The new characters get introduced in an efficient way and the whole thing feels like Star Wars, as in like something that could have come out of the golden era of the 90s. Episode two is my favorite of the season. This has Mando trying to get the bounty back to base, but wouldn't you know it, Mando forgot to lock his ship and thus the Jawas stole all his shit. This totally isn't a padding tactic. The battle against the Jawas is my favorite in all of this first season, as it looks like Mando is truly under threat and he has to get some help from Quill. Quill helps barter with the Jawas. The Jawas try and mock Mando and he lets off with the Flammenwerfer and says, understand this? So the objective of the level, I mean the episode, is to take down the Mudhorn, aka Ronto Beast. It's a tough and dirty fight, and Grogu has to help out Mando. Another strong episode. Mando turns in the bounty and gets some shiny silver armor, and eventually rescues the Yo Baby and escapes the planet. We get a cool battle between Mando and a bunch of mercs, and the other Mandos show up to help him escape. After this, the rest of the season dramatically slows down. What would have worked better is if Din dropped off Baby Yoda and didn't get paid 
had to escape a double cross with the rest of the Mandos and then gather allies to save the Yo Baby later and then and only then at the very end of the season get his spiffy silver armor. As it is, everything just happens too quickly and then the show meanders. Episode 4 is where Mando first meets Cara Dune. And their meeting is, as you would expect, it's your standard superhero fight, but thankfully it ends in a draw. And now we've got the plot of the week. This plot is just more padding. The Mandalorian and the Cara Dune have to stop some mercenaries from pushing around some townspeople. This is a plot that has been done to death, but at least it's entertaining to watch. And the mercenaries have a big ATST, and they have to destroy it in the way you'd figure they would. It trips it over and blah, 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 blah. And thus, we move on from the plot of the Yo Baby being important to solving random plots that are straight out of any sci-fi TV show ever. If this episode's plot had been in service of the overall plot, then it might have been great. Maybe when Mando and Cara Dune were looking through some information that the Mercs had, Mando could have found out where the Yo Baby came from. Or if we go with my idea, it could have been a lead for where the Imps took the Yo Baby. Also, Cara Dune just stays on the planet and doesn't leave with Mando, thus making this episode feel even more pointless. But she will return later. Episode 5 is also kind of worthless as it just sets up a recurring character that won't even be recurring within this show. Mando goes to Money Saving Tatooine and teams up with a little shit to bring in Phoenix Rand. You can guess how this goes, aka little shit tries to kill Mando and fails. Next. The next episode is way better, but still just filler. Mando goes to some old buddies for one last mission. One of the buddies is a Milflek, aka a Milf Twi'lek, and it's implied that she and Mando had some quality time, but that Mando left her and thus she is scorned. This Milflek also likely enticed many viewers due to her being featured prominently in the trailer, acting sexy. We get a few cool actors showing up for side roles. We got Clancy Brown, who is a Deferonian, and Bill Burr, I totally know that guy. He shows up as an ex stormtrooper named Mayfeld. Best part is his super space blasters are barely modified Ruger standard pistols. The Krim crew tries to screw around with Mando and learns about the Yo Baby, but not much comes of this. The plot of the episode is nothing special. Mand and the Crims gotta bust out another Crim from a New Republic prison ship. The crew of the prison ship are mostly robots, but there's one wet. And this wet is killed by the Twi'lek, who acts an awful lot like Harley Quinn. Mando did try to de-escalate the situation between the Crims and the wet, and did not want to see the wet die, thus showing Mando's slow turn to the light. The Crims decide to try and pin the death on Mando, and thus lock him up. But as you would expect, Mando takes them all down. What I didn't expect is that he takes them all down non-lethally, even the Twi'lek murderer. This is subverted later. So the prisoner that Mando was going after gets Borkin out and Mando delivers him to his criminal boss buddy, only to double cross the crime boss and let some Alliance X-Wing blow up the boss's station with said boss and the entire crew on it. The crew that may not have killed anyone. Uh, it's mostly moral, I guess. The plot returns in the final two episodes, and the final two are excellent. The plot gets kicked off when Grief Karga suggests that Mando help him take out the Imperial that set the bounty for the Yo Baby in the first place. What Grief Karga was doing for the last few episodes is not best considered. So Mando gathers his allies, kills some time, or I mean kills some runtime. He picks up Cara Dune and Quill, and Quill rebuilt the IG droid into a nurse droid, because of course he did. And that nurse droid is totally not going to be a deus ex. Eventually, we head back to another budget-friendly planet, Grief acts all sleazy, and eventually, during a cheap campfire scene, Romando has the shoulder pads on wrong. For shame, Mando, you ain't getting to the 501st with that. Sloppy kit, my guy. Touch some grass. Ugh, I think I threw up a bit there. Anyway, there's some sand dragons that get shot, Grief Karga gets wounded, but later healed by Grogu, and this starts his turn to the light. The final part of the episode has Mando brought in chains before the head Imperial as a trick to get him in close. But sadly, Quill gets found out by some scout troopers, and the episode ends with a new villain that comes completely out of nowhere, blasts the villain we do know, and introduces himself as Moff Gideon. Will our heroes be able to survive? Oh, it's the stupid droid. Oh, like with so many things in modern shows, the tension is ruined when a deus ex hit, and the IG droid shows up at the very beginning of the last episode of the season, blasts everyone, and the final battle ensues. Mando picks up a turret, blasts some bastards, but Moff Gideon hits the power pack and wounds the Mando. We then get forced drama when Mando tells his buddies to leave me behind. 
That would be great if he was more obviously wounded. He is healed seconds later by that stupid droid. We then see Din Djarin's face for two seconds. Yay. Mando quickly rejoins his crew after more runtime is killed, and we then learn that all the Mandos from Episode 3 were killed off screen. Somehow. And somehow the leader wasn't. And then she fights and wins against some Stormies with Tongs. Okay. We get some more drama when IG sacrifices himself to blow up some imps. This would have been more dramatic if he had not been introduced just in the previous episode. And also, why could our dudes not fight the stormtroopers? In season two, Mando will fight many more stormtroopers than this and not break a sweat. The final fight is Mando against Moff Gideon's TIE Fighter. Mando does his Iron Man thing and wins the day. And then he flies off into the sunset in search of a new plot. I get it. I've been being harsh to Mando. But the show could have been so much better if each episode had built upon the last and over the season we got to know Grief, Kara, and Quill better than we did. As it is, their backstories are just dumped on us and overall it feels like the plot gets going, run out of steams and meanders, and then builds up enough steam to finally end. Still though, this was a strong first season and many shows in the past could only have dripped to have the fairly basic problems that Mando had. Having the main character of a new Star Wars show be a Mandalorian was a stroke of genius. The Mandos in the true expanded universe were the Batman to the Jedi Superman. Any normal human could have been a Mando, and thus any fan could be a Fando, if they anointed themselves in the armor of adamantine strength. And thus, more fans were able to protect themselves upon Dinny. I know I did! It's thanks to all the elements that Mando succeeded for a while, where so many other Star Wars media properties failed. One only wonders how much better the show might have been if the great lady Karen Travis had had a hand in its creation. <sighs> Before The Mandalorian, I had fallen out of being a Star Wars fan, but thanks to its greatness, I got back into the franchise I loved, and despite all its flaws, Mando will always have a special place in my heart. And so I'm General Lotz, wishing you good true colors and good Imperial Commando, whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and please consider leaving a like or a comment as the algorithm desires your soul. And I want to thank all those fans who have supported this channel, both past and present.